Welcome to the Understanding Asthma research video series brought to you by the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America's Paper Project, promoting asthma patient engagement in research. This segment will cover asthma basics. Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Pistner, and I'm an allergist at Mass General Hospital for Children. I'm here to talk to you about the importance of patient engagement in research and how you can help researchers ask the questions that are important to you. Together, we can improve the lives of people in our community. After watching this video series, you will have a basic understanding of asthma, be able to recognize some of the common symptoms and triggers, and learn more about uncontrolled asthma and asthma attacks. You'll also understand why it's essential for those with asthma and their caretakers to be involved in asthma research. After watching this segment, you will have a basic understanding of asthma. So what is asthma? Asthma is a chronic disease that causes your airways to become inflamed, making it hard to breathe. Your airways are the paths that air takes to get oxygen to the body. When your airways are inflamed, they become red, swollen, and make extra mucus. This can make it hard to breathe. During normal breathing, the airways to the lungs are fully open and allow air to move in and out of the lungs freely. Asthma causes the airways to change. You can see the changes in this picture. The airway branches leading to the lungs become overly reactive and more sensitive to all kinds of asthma triggers. The lining of the airways swell and become inflamed. Mucus clogs the airways. Muscles tighten around the airways. This is called bronchospasm. The lungs have difficulty moving air in and out. Airflow obstruction, moving air out, can be especially difficult. These changes make breathing difficult and stressful. If you've ever had an asthma attack or episode, you can tell key people in your life what it feels like. Key people can be your healthcare team, parents, spouse, friends, teacher, or school nurse. Sharing what your asthma attack feels like helps them to know when you might need their help. Remind those who've never had an asthma attack that it can feel like trying to breathe through a straw that is kinked or stuffed with cotton. It's easy for anyone to try that and experience that feeling. Using a straw with any drink, they can feel for themselves that it's hard and learn it's scary when it's really happening. Asthma attacks can be mild, moderate, or serious, even life-threatening. It is important to understand asthma so that serious asthma attacks can be prevented. There is no cure for asthma, but there are ways that you can manage it, such as taking your medicine as directed by your doctor, avoiding your triggers, and treating an asthma episode if one occurs. We will cover these topics and more in our video series for understanding asthma research. This segment will cover asthma symptoms. After watching this segment, you will have a basic understanding of common asthma symptoms. If you have asthma, you may experience coughing, shortness of breath, wheezing, chest tightness, or increased mucus in your lungs. Many of these symptoms can become worse at night. Asthma can increase your rate of breathing, especially in children. Often, exercise will make asthma symptoms worse and may be the only trigger for asthma in some people. Sometimes, signs of allergies such as a runny nose, stuffy nose, happen before and during problems with asthma. If you experience any of the symptoms we've discussed, you should schedule a visit with your doctor. They will discuss your medical history and perform a physical exam. You may need a lung function test and other tests such as a chest or sinus x-ray. Have you noticed that sometimes your asthma seems to get worse at night? Uncontrolled asthma, with its underlying inflammation, often gets worse at night. It probably has to do with natural body rhythms and changes in your body's hormones. The important thing to know about nighttime asthma is that with proper management, you should be able to get your nighttime asthma under control and sleep through the night. Work with your doctor to review your treatment plan. Asthma may lead to a medical emergency. It's important to know the signs of a severe asthma episode or asthma attack and be prepared to treat it. If you're in breathing distress, you need to seek emergency medical attention. 
We will cover asthma warning signs in an upcoming video in this series. This segment will cover levels of asthma. After watching this segment, you will have a basic understanding of the different levels of asthma and learn more about uncontrolled asthma. There are four levels of asthma based on how severe it is. Intermittent asthma, you have symptoms less than twice a week and wake up less than two nights a month. Mild persistent asthma, you have symptoms two or more days a week and wake up three to four nights a month. Moderate persistent asthma, you have symptoms at least every day and wake up one or more nights a week. And severe persistent asthma, you have symptoms during the day and wake up every night due to asthma. Knowing if your asthma is controlled or uncontrolled can be helpful to you as you learn to manage your asthma. There are signs of uncontrolled asthma, such as increase in asthma symptoms like cough, chest tightness, or shortness of breath. Keep the rules of two in mind. Your asthma is well controlled if daytime symptoms happen less than two times per week, nighttime symptoms happen less than two times per month, and you need reliever medicine less than two times per week. Additionally, your activities are not limited and you don't need oral steroids or only need them once a year. So, your asthma isn't well controlled if your activities are limited, you need oral steroids more than once per year, you have daytime symptoms two or more times per week, you have nighttime symptoms two or more times per month, or you need your reliever medicine two or more times per week. If your asthma is not well controlled, it's time to see your doctor. Review your treatment plan and make sure you understand your medicines and when to use them. We will cover more about this topic in an upcoming video in this series. This segment will cover warning signs of an asthma attack. After watching this segment, you will have a better understanding of the warning signs of an asthma attack, an asthma episode, and recognize asthma triggers. What are the signs of a severe asthma attack? Understanding the different types of asthma symptoms can help you recognize when you're having a severe asthma attack. Asthma can be life-threatening. Seek emergency medical help for fast breathing with chest retractions, which means that the skin sucks in between and around the chest plate and or the rib bones when inhaling. Cyanosis, which is very pale or blue coloring of the face, lips, fingernails, and then also rapid movement of your nostrils or if your ribs and stomach are moving in and out deeply and rapidly. Expanded chest that does not deflate when you exhale, and infants can have severe asthma episodes that they may then fail to respond or recognize their parents. If your asthma is getting worse fast and medicine is not helping, you may be in the red or danger zone of asthma. Get help from a doctor immediately. If you can't contact your doctor, go directly to the emergency department. An asthma action plan from your doctor can help you understand your asthma zones. The green zone means your breathing is good. You have no symptoms and no limits in your activities. Your asthma action plan will tell you when and how often to take your daily asthma preventive medicines. The yellow zone is a caution warning. You may start having asthma symptoms or may have signs of an illness like a cold. That can make your asthma worse. Your asthma action plan will tell you if it's time to add additional medicine or if you need to call your primary care provider. The red zone is a danger zone. If you have signs of a severe asthma attack, take your medicine as prescribed immediately and seek medical help. APA has an asthma action plan you could print and take to your next appointment. Discuss the asthma zones with your doctor and make sure you understand the different asthma zones and the details of your action plan. Go to afa.org slash action plan.
This segment will cover asthma triggers. After watching this segment, you will have a basic understanding of asthma triggers. There is no cure for asthma, but you can control symptoms by taking asthma medicines and avoiding your triggers. With proper treatment and an asthma management plan, you can reduce your symptoms and enjoy a better quality of life. Talk to your healthcare provider about your asthma symptoms and be sure to discuss any changes in your asthma management or status. Asthma symptoms may be triggered or worsened by allergens. These are substances that cause allergies. They can trigger asthma. Common allergens that cause allergic asthma include dust mites. These are tiny insect-like creatures that live in our carpets, bedding, and furniture. Cockroaches. These are a common trigger of asthma. Even their dead body parts can trigger asthma. Pollen from trees, grass, and weeds trigger asthma during plant growing seasons. Mold can be found indoors and outdoors. Pets can trigger asthma in people allergic to animals, like dogs and cats. These are common. Rodents, like mice, are another allergic asthma trigger. Things that are not allergens can also trigger your asthma. Irritants in the environment can bother inflamed sensitive airway and can bring on an asthma episode. These irritants include smoke from tobacco, cigarettes, and cigars, wood fire smoke from campfires, fireplaces, and wildfires, charcoal grill smoke, strong fumes, vapors, or odors, such as paint, gasoline, perfumes, or other strong scents, chemicals, dust or particulates in the air, air pollution from smog, ozone, and other sources. Asthma symptoms can also be triggered or worsened by illnesses. Nasal or lung infections like colds, influenza, pneumonia, sinus infections are common triggers of asthma, especially in children. Exercise and other physical activities that make you breathe harder can affect your asthma. With proper treatment, you don't need to limit your physical activity due to asthma. Additional asthma triggers include the weather, dry winds, hot humid air, cold air, or sudden changes in the weather can sometimes bring on an asthma episode. Feeling strong emotions can change your breathing and affect your asthma. Laughing, yelling, crying, anger, fear, etc. These can cause wheezing or other asthma symptoms. Knowing what triggers your asthma can ultimately help you manage your symptoms. It's important to know and understand what your triggers are and how to avoid them to prevent asthma episodes. You may notice that you have other triggers in addition to what's been mentioned so far. Talk to your healthcare provider about your asthma and your triggers. This will help tailor your asthma management and treatment plan. This segment will cover asthma treatments. After watching this segment, you will learn how participation in asthma research can change and improve treatment now and in the future. Successful asthma treatment involves many elements. Understanding symptoms, warning signs, and what happens during an asthma attack assists you and those around you to respond in the most helpful way. Identifying your asthma triggers and making environment or lifestyle changes can minimize them and reduce asthma episodes. Communicating with your medical teams and other supporters, such as family or friends, lets you surround yourself with people who can aid your efforts to have your asthma under control. Even though there isn't a cure for asthma, you can take steps to control it. Regularly discussing and updating your asthma action plan with your healthcare provider ensures that you're taking quick relief or long-term controller medicines at the doses and times best for you. If you don't have an asthma action plan, download one by going to afa.org. Take it to the next healthcare provider appointment to work on it together. Unless your asthma is very mild, chances are you have prescriptions for at least two different medicines. The more you understand about what those medicines do, how to take them correctly, and why they help, the more likely you are to use them correctly. Although there are some potential side effects from taking asthma medicines, the benefits of controlling your asthma outweigh the risks. Discuss each of your asthma medicines with your doctor to learn more about their side effects. Always take your asthma medication as prescribed. There are two kinds of asthma medicines. The first are called quick relief medicines. 
They help relieve asthma symptoms when they happen by allowing the airways to open up so air can flow through them. You usually take quick relief medicine when asthma symptoms occur. If you're using quick relief medicines more than two days a week, you should talk to your healthcare provider about your asthma control to see if you need to make changes to your asthma action plan. The second type are called long-term control medicines. They help prevent and control asthma symptoms. You may take this type of medicine every day for best results. Quick relief medicines help relieve asthma symptoms when they happen by acting to quickly relax the tight muscles around the airways so air can flow through them. Let's review the different types. Short acting beta agonists are inhaled. They quickly relieve asthma symptoms by relaxing the smooth muscles around the airways and decrease the swelling that blocks airflow. These medicines are the first choice for quick relief of asthma symptoms. Anticholinergics are also inhaled but act slower than short acting beta agonists. They open the airways by relaxing the smooth muscles around the airways and reduce mucus production. Combination quick relief medicines are available. These contain both the anticholinergic and short acting beta agonists. The combination comes in an inhaler or a nebulizer for inhalation. Don't forget to talk to your healthcare provider about revising your asthma action plan if you're using your quick relief medicines more than two days a week. The goal is to have control of asthma to prevent asthma attacks before they happen. For that, you may be using a long-term control medicine. Let's review the different types of long-term control medicines that help prevent and control asthma symptoms. Inhaled corticosteroids prevent and reduce airway swelling. They also reduce mucus in the lungs. These are the most effective long-term control medicines available. Inhaled long-acting beta agonists open the airways by relaxing the smooth muscles around the airways. If this medicine is used, it should always be taken in combination with an inhaled corticosteroid. Combination inhaled medicines are available as a convenient way to take inhaled corticosteroid and long-acting beta agonists together. Leukotriene modifiers reduce swelling inside the airways and relax smooth muscles. They come in pill or liquid form. Chromalin sodium is an inhaled non-steroid medicine that prevents airways from swelling when they come in contact with an asthma trigger. Theophylline comes as a tablet, capsule, solution or syrup taken by mouth. It opens the airways by relaxing the smooth muscles. Oral corticosteroids like prednisone come in pill or liquid form. They may be prescribed to treat asthma attacks that don't respond to other asthma medicines. They may be used as long-term therapy for people with severe asthma, but can have significant side effects. There are now other options called biologics for people with severe asthma. Biologics are shots or infusions given every few weeks. They target a cell or protein in your body to prevent airway inflammation. They can be very expensive treatments and are usually only prescribed if other asthma medicines have not controlled your asthma. But the side effects for the biologics may be less than long-term use of oral corticosteroids and so may be a safer option for people with severe asthma. Asthma is different for everyone and new therapies are being investigated. In order for new treatments to become available, drugs must undergo a series of tests and trials before they're approved. It is important for patients to be involved in the research process to help create the treatments that are needed. As you live with asthma, you are researching and learning every day. Breaking news related to asthma research, care, and treatments will be shared in sound bites on the radio, brief medical segments on TV, or in newly published research findings on websites or in newsletters. Anyone diagnosed with asthma is part of research data. For example, people with asthma are anonymously counted in county, state, and nationally reported data. Those using a particular control or quick relief medication may report side effects. Those using a particular inhaler or device may have provided feedback that leads to redesign. Hospitals are required to track and report data that demonstrates 
how they're doing with providing care to patients with asthma. They monitor the number of emergency room visits for asthma and the number of days patients admitted with asthma stay in the hospital. While you continue to learn more in order to live your life without limits, you and your healthcare team may participate in current research, pay close attention to asthma research outcomes, and assist in designing future asthma research projects. By staying closely connected to asthma research, you will ensure your asthma action plan is providing the best and most innovative care for you. If you're interested in participating in asthma or allergy clinical trials, ask your healthcare provider, contact a local asthma or allergy specialist or academic center, or visit afa.org, clinicaltrials.gov, or pcori.org. Learn how to explore, be involved, and influence the future of asthma care in our video series for understanding asthma research. This segment will cover why do we need asthma research. After watching this segment, you will understand research basics and why it's important for people with asthma to get involved in research. Research can feel a bit complicated and be hard to understand. Let's break it down a bit. If you look at the definition of research from the online Merriam-Webster dictionary, you'll see it described as a careful or diligent search or a studious inquiry or examination, or collecting information about a particular subject. Asthma research also searches, investigates, and collects information. For example, asthma research may search to figure out different causes of asthma, investigate the effects of asthma on patients, follow people with asthma over time to see how they do with different medicines, treatment, or lifestyle changes, or study and collect information about different treatments. Asthma research has helped to explain why there are different outcomes in different populations of people. Researchers use what they learn to suggest the best care for different ages, genders, and races, ethnicities. Patients, families, and healthcare providers use research every day to support and improve the lives of those with asthma. They can find out about risk factors that cause differences and spread ideas that can reduce those differences. By working together, researchers, patients, families, and healthcare providers can find ways to reduce the impact of asthma. Here's an example. Asthma research taught us that African American and Latino children living in some urban areas have higher asthma rates, more symptoms, and more deaths than white children do. These imbalances could be due to the type of healthcare treatment available, poor housing options that allow more exposure to allergens and trigger asthma, and or the stress of living in certain locations. New York City is taking steps to promote healthy housing. Advocacy groups encourage the city's lawmakers to pass the Asthma-Free Housing Act, which would require building owners to routinely inspect for asthma triggers, it would require building owners to use responsible ways to address trigger causes at the source instead of superficial repairs. It would require landlords to tell tenants about asthma triggers and how to fix them. And it creates a system so doctors can recommend that the city inspect a patient's housing to find and fix asthma triggers. This example shows how results from one area of asthma research that looked at where someone lives can influence changes in policies and treatments to help improve asthma rates and reduce tragic deaths from asthma. Results from this research could be significant to many of the nearly 25 million Americans with asthma striving to live a life without limits. This segment covers finding accurate research information. After watching this segment, you will have a basic understanding of how to find accurate research. These days, when you seek medical care, you may visit a group, practice, a specialist, in urgent care, or others. Many of us see different primary care providers for well or sick visits. This can lead to mixed messages about which medicines and treatments are best for asthma control. You want to be an active participant whenever you're obtaining health care. 
Keep in mind, you may get mixed messages when searching the internet for information on the best treatments or medicines for asthma. As you search for best information, here are three quick tips for finding expert research-based materials that will help you be an active participant at any healthcare visit. Begin by identifying what you need to know. If what you need to know is information about medical products or foods that maintain or improve health, then you can check out information from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, usually referred to as the FDA. This federal government agency in charge of protecting public health by making sure that human and animal drugs, natural products, and medical devices are safe, effective, and secure. They support innovation or inventions that make medical products more effective, safe, and affordable. They help the public get accurate science-based information about health-related medical products and food. If what you need to know is information about medical research discoveries that improve health and save lives, look at the National Institutes of Health. It is common to hear them referred to by their initials, NIH. It is the nation's medical research agency. Funding dollars come directly from the U.S. Congress. They have 27 different sections called institutes and centers. Each one has a special research focus on a particular disease or body system. The National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute oversees asthma research and initiatives. Visit them at NIH.gov. This segment will cover outcome measures. After watching this segment, you'll have a basic understanding of outcome measures. Did you know that every researcher has to describe what they want to find out before they can start researching? In asthma research, the experts do this by planning to evaluate the results of their studies using specific asthma outcome measures. These measures could be looking at results of tests, like markers in the blood, such as immunoglobulin E, IgE, spirometry testing, which is a type of lung test that measures the amount of air that you're able to breathe in and out. Measures also could be reviewing asthma control questionnaires or asthma control test scores, measuring the number of asthma attacks, doctor's office or emergency department visits a patient had in a set period of time, reviewing a type of asthma medication use or asthma symptoms. There is a relatively new outcome measure called Patient Reported Outcome Measures. Patient Reported Outcome Measures are the measure of treatment outcomes reported by patients or caregivers. These focus on quality of life of patients and or their caregivers. Research that is focused on these patient reported outcome measures will shed light on ways asthma and allergies affect the day-to-day -day life of patients and their caregivers. Learn more about how to get involved and influence the future in our video series for understanding asthma research. This segment will cover clinical research. After watching this segment, you'll have a basic understanding of clinical research. So what's clinical research? Clinical research studies health and illness in people. Clinical research is called many different things. Some of the various terms used to describe clinical research are clinical trials, clinical studies, medical trials, studies, research trials, and protocols. Researchers may do clinical research to explore the cause of a disease or set of symptoms, to test if a treatment can help with a symptom or a condition, or to learn how certain behaviors affects people's health. Researchers may want to compare one treatment to another or look at how a treatment affects different types of people. Clinical research tests new ways to prevent, detect, or treat disease. So what does this mean for patients? Treatments can be new drugs or combinations of drugs, new surgical procedures or tools, or new ways to use existing treatments. Clinical trials can also test other aspects of care, such as ways to improve quality of life for people with chronic illnesses. 
clinical studies are led by a researcher called the principal investigator, the PI. There is typically a research team, which may include physicians, nurses, social workers, and other healthcare professionals. Clinical research is usually sponsored or paid for by either pharmaceutical companies, academic centers, voluntary groups, nonprofit organizations, federal agencies like the NIH, PCORI, U.S. Department of Defense, and U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Also, healthcare providers and other individuals. In the past, research was sometimes conducted without patient's consent. Today, patients must be informed regarding the risks and benefits of participation in clinical research prior to enrolling. They must sign a document called informed consent. If you decided to participate, you can change your mind after the study has begun. This is part of the informed consent process. Informed consent provides potential study participants with information about the clinical trial so they can decide whether they want to enroll. Details about the risks, benefits, or alternatives of joining the trial are shared. The document must be signed before joining. Even though you sign up, the informed consent document is not a contract of any kind and participants can withdraw from a study at any time for any reason. Additionally, to ensure the health of participants, a clinical study is done according to a research plan known as the research protocol. It answers specific research questions and ensures the health of participants. This protocol will include the reason for conducting the study, who can participate, the number of participants needed, the schedule of tests, procedures, or drugs in their dosages, the length of the study, and what information will be gathered about participants. Oversight is provided by an Institutional Review Board, sometimes referred to as an IRB. The IRB is a group of doctors, researchers, professors, and members of the community. In fact, any of us could be part of an IRB group. Their job is to review protocols and informed consent documents, and then approve or disapprove the research study. The IRB review confirms that a study is ethical and that the rights and welfare of the participants are protected. Today, there are rules and regulations that ensure everyone's safety and protect participants from harm. Clinical studies have rules that are listed in the research protocol outlining who can and who can't participate. Some studies seek participants who have the illness or conditions that will be studied. Some studies are looking for healthy volunteers, and some studies are limited to a predetermined group of people asked by researchers to enroll. The factors that qualify someone for participation in a clinical study are called inclusion criteria. The factors that disqualify someone from participation are called exclusion criteria. Inclusion and exclusion criteria are based on characteristics such as age, gender, type and stage of disease, previous treatment history, and other existing medical conditions. Do you want to participate in clinical research? Participating in a clinical study contributes to medical knowledge. The results of these studies can make a difference in the care of future patients. Some trials may provide participants with the possibility of receiving direct medical benefits, while others may not. This segment will cover clinical trials. After watching this segment, you'll have a basic understanding of clinical trials. A clinical trial involves research using human volunteers and is intended to add to our medical knowledge. There are two main types of clinical studies, clinical trials and observational studies. In this segment, we'll talk about clinical trials. A clinical trial is the best way to prove a treatment or medical approach works. Sometimes a clinical trial can't be used. For example, scientists can't randomly assign people to live in different places or ask people to start smoking or eating an unhealthy diet. What's it like when you participate in a clinical trial? As a participant, you are contributing to research to benefit future patients. You may or may not receive any benefits to yourself. 
You could receive specific interventions, treatments, with a medical product like a drug or a device. You might have a procedure. You may be asked to change a behavior like diet or exercise. The researcher will compare the new drug, procedure, or change in behavior to one that is already used. The scientists are trying to figure out if a treatment, procedure, or behavior is safe and effective by measuring results of the study participants. Sometimes they compare a new medication and a placebo, which is a fake pill or inhaler that doesn't have a real medication in it. By comparing a new treatment to people who don't receive the treatment, it helps to learn whether a new product or approach will be helpful, harmful, or no different than available alternatives, including no intervention or treatment with a placebo. You will hear or read about a clinical trial being in a certain phase. There are four phases to a clinical trial. In phase one, researchers will check for safety in humans and select the dose for future study. There are usually less than 100 participants in this phase. In phase two, tests are done to see if a treatment works on a small group of participants. There are usually 100 to 300 participants in this phase. Phase three proves or disproves the treatments and monitors effects on a large group. There could be a thousand or more participants in this phase. Phase four will start when there has been a media announcement and release of a new medication. During phase four, researchers are beginning to look at long-term use. There will be thousands involved in this phase. When you engage in research, you're shaping the future of asthma care for yourself and others. If you're interested in participating in asthma or allergy clinical trials, ask your healthcare provider, contact a local asthma or allergy specialist or academic center, or visit afa.org, clinicaltrials.gov, or pcori.org. This presentation has been brought to you proudly by Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, with funding by the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI.